Good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining us for the regular scheduled Village Board meeting on September 10th, 2024. Please join me with the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice. Uh, Lana, roll call, please. Mayor DeVoe. Here. Trustees Amos. Here. Brockman. Here. Carroll. Here. Chapman. Here. Luciano. Here. And Selfridge. Trustee Selfridge was not able to join us this evening. He didn't let us know that there is a conflict. So we do, but we do have a quorum this evening. We do have the ability to conduct those business with that. Uh, we'll move into our next section, which would be citizens. Are there any citizens wishing to address the village board this evening? Okay, seeing none, we'll move into our consent agenda for this evening. <clears throat> consent agenda item number one will be approval of the regular meeting minutes for August 27, 2024. I'm asking that we remove item number two at this time, which will be the committee of the whole meeting minutes. We've uh, that we want to make an adjustment before we get those finalized for everybody. Moving on to consent agenda, item number three will be approval of accounts payable in the amount of $545,209.91. Approval of the payment in the amount of $119,605.50 to Hacienda Landscaping for the River's Edge Park Phase A project. Number five will be approval of the payment in the amount of $44,700. $44,777.24 to Porter Corporation for the River's Edge Park Shelter. And item number six would be approval of a payment amount of $42,350 to TNS Seal Coating for the 2024 Seal Coating Program. Are there any questions regarding the consent agenda items listed? Make a motion to approve the consent agenda, eliminating item two. Uh, motion, Trustee Luciano. Second, Trustee Carroll. Roll call, please. Brockman. Yes. Carroll. Yes. Chapman. Yes. Luciano. Yes. And Amos. Yes. Uh, moving into reports of communications. Lana, is there anything that you have noted for this evening? No, sir. Uh, I will take a moment and ask that anybody from our public please remember that this is the eve of September 11th. Uh, September 11th, 2001 was a tragic day in our history. And please try to take a moment of silence and recognizing that at midnight or at least at some point during the day tomorrow, September 11th. I ask that we move on to uh, order of business for this, e for this evening, which business item number one will be a consideration for approval of a resolution approving a site plan amendment for a parking lot expansion at the Shorewood Troy Library. Uh, Trustee Brock. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Jenny Mills came before us from the Shorewood Troy Public Library at our last meeting and uh, wants to reduce the amount of landscaping on their project, uh, not only because of the cost, but also because they're not going to put the second uh, parking lot in at this time. Uh, I do want to report that it comes here with a 7 0 vote uh, of approval to recommend to the village board. So, uh, uh, Natalie, do you have anything else you'd like to add to that? Um, not really. Um, the, the landscaping that they'll be adding is the landscaping that was along the um, south end of the property line, um, which would be more necessary if they were doing the full parking lot or putting in the expansion. Um, other than that, there was very little that was reduced. Any other questions or concerns on this uh, item? If not, Make a motion to approve resolution approving a site plan amendment for a parking lot expansion at the Shorewood Troy Public Library. Second. second. Uh, motion Brockman, second Chapman. Roll call, please. Carol. Yes. Chapman. Yes. Luciano. Yes. Amos. Yes. And Brockman. Yes. All right. This is item number one has been approved. The uh, parking lot amendments good to go. Business item number two will be a consideration for approval of a resolution accepting a plat of dedication and easement for the Southwest Furniture Road Sanitary Main Extension. Back to Trustee Brock. Thank you again, Mayor. Uh, this came before us at our last meeting. Uh, not much uh, discussion on it. Uh, just uh, Mr. Slavic showed us where this um, uh, dedication and improvements are going to be at for uh, sewer. 
extension and uh, that'll definitely open that up down there not only for him but for the church that plans on building down there so it was not much discussion it does come here with a 7-0 vote again and Natalie would you like to add anything to that um, no if the plot of the dedication is on the screen um, very simple just provides us with the right of way um, project is underway mr. Slavic wanted to take advantage of the fact that the silo road improvements were going in sort of for some economies and also so that that way it doesn't have to be open cut in the future I see digging in that subdivision on the north side of Siles, that part of this? Yes. Okay. That's where it's going to go in at then from yes, there? Yes, that's where it connects. Okay. Anybody have any questions for Natalie or Steve mm -hmm. on that? If not, I'll make a motion to uh, approve a resolution accepting a plat of dedication and easement for Southwest, Southwest Frontage Road Sanitary Main Extension. Second. Motion Trustee Brockman, second Trustee Carroll. Roll call, please. Chapman. Yes. Luciano. Yes. Amos. Yes. Brockman. Yes. And Carroll. Yes. All right. Business item number two has been approved. Moving on to business item three. Consideration for approval of an ordinance amending Title 10 of the Shoreward Village Code regarding the ORI Zoning District and associated definitions. This item is up for a first read. Uh, over to Trustee Brockman one more time. Thank you again, Mayor. We uh, reopened the public hearing um, at our last meeting that uh, that uh, was extended from the August 14th meeting. Uh, no citizens spoke during the public hearing. Um, and again, it comes here with a 7 0 vote, and I'm sure that Natalie has a bulk of stuff to tell us about on this one. <laughs> sure. Thank um, you. Thank you. So, um, staff has been working on a com on a amendment to the ORI zoning ordinance, um, the, the district. Um, it was motivated by a number of things. Um, some of the comp plan goals and objectives call for some improvements. Um, there's a strong industrial real estate market, so we believe that we're gonna be seeing industrial projects in the near future, including some industrial type projects we've been working on recruiting. Um, the code is quite dated, so we thought that it was important to modernize the ordinance to include some newer uses. Um, we also wanted to make sure that we had uses listed that would bring good jobs that would be desirable to the community. We wanted to create codes that are more user friendly. Developers like predictability. So when we include information in our codes that tell them exactly what's expected, that's helpful. And we also wanted to add standards to better guide industrial development to make sure that it is the quality that we expect. Unless um, you want me to slow down, I'll try to move through this pretty quickly, but if you want me to read through any of the definitions or anything, um, please just say so. Um, one of the things that we do in front of every single uh, zoning district is we have an intent. In this case, we've done a few modifications to the intent to talk a little bit more about the modern type of businesses and the environment we want. I'll, I'll read this. Um, the ORI Office Research and Light Industrial District is intended to provide a modern campus-like environment suitable for research and development activities, technology and innovation businesses, engineering and testing activities, office uses, warehouse and logistics facilities, and limited manufacturing that will not have an adverse effect upon the environmental quality of the community. Pretty similar um, to what was there earlier, but um, a little bit more geared towards what we're looking for. A couple of newer uses that we thought were important to put in there were co-working spaces. This is essentially a building or a space that's built so that different businesses can come in and use it. Sometimes it's people working from home, Sometimes it's corporations having meetings. A data center is another thing that's generally quite desirable, and this is a building that would house servers and other equipment for storing digital data. An entrepreneurship center or a business accelerator is a business that essentially provides spaces and services to people who are starting new businesses or would like to grow their existing businesses. We would also like to just clear some things up um, we would add a use um, that's offices, including medical offices, professional offices, and business offices, with a definition just to kind of clarify that that's appropriate in the zoning district as well. We would add studios, including art studios and broadcasting studios, with a definition for broadcasting studios. These are uses that are tending to go in these light industrial parks. We would also add technology and innovation businesses. Um, this can be a bunch of different types of businesses that focus on technology. They can be software businesses content developers, communication, electronic equipment manufacturing, data processing, 
computer system designs, quantum computing, aerospace, parts manufacturing, and internet publication and broadcasting, just a wide array, array of businesses that we feel would be useful and would bring good jobs to the community. We wanted to tidy up the language that defines research and development businesses and also to provide a better definition. We also wanted to amend some of the language regarding our logistics categories and to provide specific definitions. In this case, we would um, strike the word motor freight terminals and define freight terminals from our existing definitions and we would add definitions for three other types of businesses. First one, fulfillment centers. That's essentially, you know, like the highly coveted Amazon fulfillment center or businesses like that where they're shipping products directly to customers and sometimes they're good tax providers. Logistics centers, warehouses and define it properly. And we want to define transfer center to be sh sure to clarify what we would like and what we would not. We thought that it would also be appropriate to have automobile rental or sales within the, industri the light industrial district. It's becoming more and more common to have warehouses where there are a number of cars stored inside that go up for sale on the internet. Sometimes they have yards where they park them, but we thought that would be a good use either for rental, something like an Avis or a budget or automobile sales. Um, same thing for truck rental or sales and equipment rental or sales. Um, there are also a couple of other uses that we think are sometimes appropriate in a bigger business park, like a daycare center or a veterinary clinic or hospital. So we added those. We did not add definitions because they were all already in there. Um, in those were all, what I listed was all things that we're proposing to add to the permitted use list. There are some other uses that are appropriate with a conditional use permit. First one we listed is flex spaces. This is kind of a multi-function space where you've got an office and a warehouse or a showroom and storage or things like that. Um, typically they have one or two loading docks and doors, but they also have customer facing facades. Um, we would rephrase the definition of warehousing, receiving and moving van distribution centers to say moving companies or van lines with the definition. We thought that was clearer. Um, and that, those are basically the proposed use amendments. Does anybody have any questions on those before I move on? Are all the initial ones you mentioned, not the ones talked about conditional use, the initial ones you mentioned, they are automatically approved or would they have to come to the board? Any, any site plans would have to come to the board, but the use, if it were moving into an existing building, would just be automatically approved with a business license review. So. When a business comes in and there are permitted use, the staff will ask them all the questions and make sure it fits within our zoning category. And if it does, then we can sign off on it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, when we were thinking about the modern industrial parks, we were also thinking that it's not really a good place for outdoor storage. Right now, the ORI districts that we have, for the most part, are down on Southwest Frontage Road, like where the Bob's Warehouse is, um, the Slyby and things like that. Those don't have any outdoor storage, and we thought for this newer type of business park, we shouldn't have any outdoor storage, so we have proposed striking any permissions and requiring that any storage and warehousing be inside. What about uh, like Jewel and all them? They keep stuff out there all the time. So, Mariano's. Sure, so some of those. Home Depot. Some of those have permission for different types in their conditional use permits or their PUDs. Uh, we can take a look at that. Some of them have specific outdoor sales spaces. Like, for example, the Home Depot with their garden center and where they have the sheds and the trailers parked. Some of those are permitted, um, and some may just be doing it without permission, which we can look into. Yeah, and, and those are in the, the, the ones that you're referring to are in the B3 district. So this is specifically for the ORI district, so it would be the warehouse district. It also would not impact businesses on Amon Dodge, Earl, or Geneva, because those are zoned differently. They're zoned I-2. So underground storage would, would be out of that then, right? So they would follow their own rules, which does allow storage in the back and screened areas in those districts. And in the B3 district, there should not be any outdoor storage unless they were specifically allowed by the board with the PD. Okay, thank you. Um, there is currently a restriction on advertising businesses that aren't the principal business. So for example, say you had an office building and they had a little cafeteria and the ground floor or a cafe or something like that or a FedEx Express or something like that, they could not put a sign on the outside of the business. We thought if there are those service businesses in those parks and their accessory, we wouldn't necessarily mind. So we struck the fact that they could not advertise outside. They'd still be able to put a typical sign. Uh, there are several references in the code currently to 
thing is to residential districts, so specific requirements for setbacks and screening and things like that. We're proposing to expand that to cover not just existing residential districts, but areas that are planned to be residential in our comprehensive plan. So if you look at this Westbury expansion, essentially all of those areas that are colored yellow are planned residential, so we would include those for the setbacks. A good example is along Bell Road. If we were to approve the comp plan, which is up next, then those businesses would have to meet the requirements as though the area north of it, which is colored yellow, were already residentially zoned. A lot of those out in the county, even though they have houses on them, are zoned agricultural. This is probably the biggest of the changes that we have, and that is altering the maximum height. Right now, business, buildings in the ORI district are a maximum of 50 feet, except that when you issue a conditional use, they can be up to 100 feet, which would require a public hearing, um, as required for a particular research or development use to which the property in question is to be put. We are proposing to make an amendment that you would be allowed to, the village board would be allowed to approve as part of a site plan review process, a building that is a maximum of 95 feet tall, but in the case that it is a multi-story data center, research and development business, or technology and innovation business, and instead of having the typical setback, we would require that it be at least 200 feet setback from the public right of way, existing residential districts, and plan residential districts as part of the site plan review process. So basically, we're taking it down about five feet, being very specific about who would be allowed to do it, and making sure that there's a more significant buffer. Um, this is being done in response to some of the feedback that we're hearing from some businesses that we covet and are trying to convince to come ashore with. Any questions on that? I, I do. On the 95 feet, you know, I, I, when I saw that uh, at Planning and Zoning, I talked to the uh, fire chief, mm -hmm. and they don't have any equipment that can reach that far. He said, on the most, probably be 75 feet. So you maybe ought to reach back out to them before we, they can't get that high. Sure. And, safely. And we, right. And if we had a building that, um, we were looking at doing this, we would obviously be having it reviewed um, by the fire district before bringing it forward. But that's a very good point, that we'd have to make sure they could reach it. The other thing we need to keep in mind is a lot of this expansion area is actually not in the same fire district. So we'd, we'd actually be having to coordinate with a different fire district in this. Yeah, in they're the probably all in the same boat as far they, as they the They probably heights. are, yes. Same, same thing applies though, it's no different than any high rise. The fire department still has to access yeah, safe, safe stairways. The top as well, they can't do it anyway. So it's not it's nothing new in the fire service. No, I'm just saying. Yeah. I mean, we're 20 plus feet <laughs> taller than what they can reach. Is what he said. Right. So what we typically do is. What, go ahead, Tony. Uh, I just want to clarify something. The 95 feet would have to be approved by the board. Yes, as, as part of the site plan review process. So it wouldn't need a public hearing, but it would be part of what so you. So it's approved. not automatic. So it's something that would have to come to the board to approve the height. Yes. Yes, and, and everything, really all the site plans do come to the board for approval. Would you agree? Yes. yes. Um, the other thing, just to sort of give some context, um, when we do, before we bring the site plan reviews to you for approval, there's typically about a three month process where the village staff, the fire district, the, and the consultants review the project and work with them to make sure they work. So that, that has typically taken place before we come to see you. So the fire district, be it the Troy Township, or the Minooka Fire District would have already looked at it before it comes to you and would have made a recommendation on it. And then before the building is approved, um, the fire district also has a review, which they typically send out to a private consultant to review to make sure that given the parameters of the building, there's adequate sprinklering and access for fire and all of those things. So just, just to let you know that before you see it, we will have made sure to answer all of those questions and make sure to be giving a recommendation based on what's safe. Uh, the other thing that comes up often in Shorewood is the idea of what the architectural design looks like. And it's, it's always a challenging thing for me because I really like it when we have good looking buildings, but at the same time, I understand that developers like predictability. They wanna know what's expected of them. So I think it's time for us to start looking at bringing architectural design guidelines into the code. So here's a, a first uh, attempt at that. Uh, building on the top right, Fairly attractive pole barn, but I've heard multiple times that, you know, that's not really the type of look that we're looking for in Shoreward. We would rather sort of higher quality buildings with more design, such as the two on the bottom. So we have gone through and done 
some architectural design standards. Um, first set have to do with building siting, so that we're requiring that buildings be oriented so that entries, office areas, and pedestrian scale amenities are on the exposed side of the building, basically the nice, nice side faces out. Um, they should be configured to conceal loading docks, roll-up doors, mechanical equipment, you know, high vehicle activity equipment and things like that. So that that way, you know, what's seen from the street is really the nice view and that they can't have any of those things on any side that fronts a residential district or a planned residential district. Um, that service and mechanical areas need to be designed as an architectural feature of the building and entirely screened from view from public rights of way. So that's when, you know, if they want to put up any type of mechanical equipment, they need to landscape it or put up a wing wall or things like that. And they need to make sure to have significant buffer and landscape space. We talked a little bit about landscape space and buffers and berms and things like that last meeting. Um, the other thing is building materials. Uh, there's been a lot of talk in Shoreward about building materials. So we have a proposal that on at least 85% of the principal facade and 65% of the other facade uh, that they use durable materials. Uh, examples given are brick, stone, concrete wall panels with smooth finishes and cast and reveals. That's essentially what you see on um, Southwest Frontage Road down in the Heartland Business Park. Um, Integrated colored concrete masonry blocks or utility bricks. So what we're not looking for is your standard old school block that's painted, but one that's actually integrally colored. A good example of that is the side of the Aldi's building. That's a utility brick, which is half of the CMU. Um, EFIS or stucco provided that it's at least three feet up from the ground. Sometimes cars will hit it and it'll chip off, so we want to make sure that there's something more durable at the bottom. And then obviously brick, masonry, veneer, and veneer would be appropriate as well. So here's, here's some examples. On the left side, you have the um, concrete wall panels. In the center, you have the uh, concrete masonry blocks on the top with the um, utility bricks on the bottom. And on the right, you have the idea of EFIS or stucco with a brick base. There has been another product that's been brought up to us as we're working with um, different uh, businesses as, as desirable to use, and that is an insulated metal, metal panel system. Um, most of them are made by a company called Kingspan. And these are products that can look very bland or they can look very nice depending on how the architecture is designed. So what we've proposed is to allow that this can be used, but to have some additional standards if they want to do that. So. I'll show you these. Um, the first one, word you've probably never heard before, is fenestration. Fenestration basically means having windows and doors in the building. So we think it would be appropriate to use the insulated metal panels if you have at least 15% fenestration. Up at the top right is by a very crude drawing showing what 15% looks like. On the bottom left is a building that I think has approximately that amount. And then I thought that, you know, sometimes it's not practical to put real windows in a building, but you want to make it look nice. So the bottom right is an example of sort of some fake windows that you can do using glass or other materials or shiny materials and things like that to make it look like there's there's more fenestration. So we think that that would help to make an insulated metal panel building look better. Um, the other one is modulation of a facade. That basically means projecting the building upward, you know, moving it up or down or in or out to just sort of break that up so it doesn't look like a continuous wall. And the third idea is using different material textures and patterns and shifting the patterns just to add interest. And there's a couple of examples of that. And this is basically additional standards that would be used if they use these insulated metal panels. Um, we feel that you know using the 85% durable material standard and the 65 for the other facades is appropriate. Um, sometimes people like to use different <coughs> accent materials. So we've put so that they can use Things like cement board, tile, wood, architectural wall panels, and things like that. They cannot use vinyl siding, metal siding, standard concrete blocks, or the double T precast panels, which you would see if you looked at a parking garage. Um, and then also, just to make sure we don't have crazy buildings, um, that the building should be like light natural colors, like shades of white, beige, tan, or gray, so you can't go and paint your building neon orange and neon green, because we don't think that would fit. For all of the buildings in the industrial park, um, we have some architectural standards we're proposing. Um, and so basically what we're saying is, you know, that a, a plain box is not what we want to see, so they have to add some details. So we've proposed that they add at least two detail features for every 150 
uh, feet of linear feet, and that basically calls for buildings similar to what you see on Southwest Frontage Road. So what they can do is they can change the building plane, so shift it back or forth. They can change the roof lines, so taller roof lines and shorter roof lines. They can change the building patterns, so they could have you know square patterns and long narrow patterns or straight patterns, things like that. They can play with color. Um, they can add glass, either a window or a panel. Um, they could change the building materials, so say go from you know stone to ephus or something like that. They could change the facade texture, so say they have a stucco and one is smooth and one is bumpy, they, they could do something like that. And they could add an accent feature like a medallion or a column or a band or something like that. So we thought that was appropriate. Um, this is an example of a building in Shorewood and we did test that to make sure it would meet our standard. Um, and we also said that secondary facades should relate to the primary facade. So the back doesn't have to be as detailed as the front, but it has to look like it belongs on the same building. Uh, principal entrances should either be projected out or recessed so they sort of stand apart from the rest of the building and it's obvious where you need to go in. They need to incorporate windows and doors and things like that. And then when there's a building addition, you don't have to match it perfectly, but you have to do something that makes sense. Um, so that's the end of sort of what we thought was appropriate. Um, the ordinance does become quite a bit stricter, but it's also quite a bit more straightforward so that there's more expectation of you know, what the village is expecting. It also will give us some latitude that we can approve some annexations and zonings uh, with some comfort that we're covered by the zoning ordinance. Um, typically, we've approved annexations with a specific plan in mind. If we have better codes, we can be a little bit more relaxed with that and you know, rely on our code to give them direction as well. Oh, thank you, Natalie. Very nice presentation. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, Trustee Carol and I were afraid you were going to give the hour and a half presentation you gave us at planning and zoning. So uh, thanks for thanks for keeping it down. So. No problem. Uh, any other feedback during planning and zoning, Trustee Brockman? <clears throat> other than um, that was noted. You know, I can't remember. Um, I wish Scott was here because uh, he he asked several good questions. You know, the Planning and Zoning Commission did have two recommendations um, that we incorporated into the ordinance. Um, one was when we started talking about the automobile rental and sales. They wanted to make sure that it was clear that they could park in the lot. And the other one was to confirm that if there were accessory structures, um, that they would could not be taller than the building. So we did add some language in there uh, in the ordinance to reflect that. You, so you incorporated the planning and zoning I recommendations. Did, yes. And I think you're referring to like uh, big round tanks or something they were talking about. Right. Yeah, right. So, yeah. so yeah. somebody didn't pull up like a, a storage silo yeah. or something next yeah. to an yeah. existing yeah. facility okay. or something. Right. And if they needed to, then we'd be bringing it back and asking for a variance. Anybody have any other questions for Natalie? Or yeah, just a quick one. In the code, uh, it prohibits the pole barn look specifically. It does. Okay, very good. The the examples you give are very good looking. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is a first read, but if we're comfortable, we can go ahead. Wait, you, there's an awful lot to digest here. Is this something we could wave off till the next meeting? If you wish. Yeah, I, I, I'd like to look into some of this different architectural stuff. I know in the past, some of our concerns were that some, it, uh, architectural quotes we do have could cost some businesses not to come here because of the expense it would cost to build the building. So I'd just like to have sure. a chance. I mean, if everyone else wants to go through it, it's fine, but that's just my feeling. I'd we'll just like to take a deeper look at it. Any problem with that? No, no, we can leave it. There's no problem with okay. that. We can leave it as a first. Okay. All right. Moving on to business item number four, be consideration for approval of an ordinance amending Title IX of the Shore Village Code 2024 Comprehensive Plan Update. This item is up for a second read. And one more time for Trustee Brockman. Well, we're putting uh, Natalie in overload time tonight. <laughs> so, um, like the mayor said, this is up for a second read. Is there any uh, questions or concerns about uh, what we went through the last time? Natalie, did you want to add a few things? Go right ahead. No, we haven't changed the text at all. Um, so if you are comfortable with it and the language that it had last time, then I think um, you're okay. And I'm happy to answer any questions if you have any others. Yeah, I'm fine. I was 
Okay. If everybody is uh, everybody's good. We'll make a motion to approve an ordinance amending Title IX of Shoreward Village Code 2024 Comprehensive Plan Update. We got a motion by Trustee Brockman. Second. Second, Trustee Amos. Roll call, please. Luciano. Yes. Amos. Yes. Brockman. Yes. Carol. Yes. And Chapman. Yes. All right, business item number five will be discussion of a concept plan for Anderson's towing at 300 Amandage. Over to Ms. Ankle. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Anderson is here uh, this evening because he is interested in bringing Anderson's towing to 300 Amandage Drive. Um, they are currently located in Shanahan, but they've sold their property and their business, and they'll be moving the towing business, um, and they'd like your input. They offer towing services, including services to local police departments, um, where they'll, they'll, they'll tow vehicles sometimes to their lot and hold them there. Um, they can either be vehicles that are in good shape, say somebody was pulled over by the police because they got a DUI or they were driving without a license, they could tow vehicles, operable vehicles. They may also be towing vehicles that were in an accident and weren't drivable. Um, so they, what they're doing is they're looking at um, renting the space uh, they're looking at an 18 month rental. They would have their offices in the building. The building would be shared with Hammer Express, which is a logistics building that's there now. Um, they would have almost the entire back lot. I believe Hammer Express is looking to keep four sem uh, three semis and their trailers there, but the rest would be for Anderson's towing. Uh, the lot measures just over an acre. The building is just under 5,000 square feet and um, the back area is about a half an acre of gravel storage area as well as the old building pad. Typically, the uh, vehicles are dropped off during the day. Uh, Mr. Anderson looked at the last two weeks to give us an example of how many buildings we're looking at. Um, he said there were 40 calls, so 28 of those were between 6 a.m. and 6 p.m., and 12 of those were between 6 p.m. and 6 a.m. So, the majority of them are during the day, um, but there are some vehicles that are towed at night. Um, typically, they'll have four staff there that'll park in the front lot. There are about 10 to 25 total cars on the property. Um, five to tw you know, 25 of them are impounded or impaired, so they may not be operable. Um, they're typically working with insurance companies, so usually the buildings come into the lot and are turned around and leave the lot within seven days. Um, what they're doing is they'll put the Operable cars, say the ones where there was a police stop and they were drivable, they'll put them on one side, they'll put the other cars on uh, that are inoperable on the other side. Um, they estimate about two to three tow truck visits a day. They're typically less than five minutes. Um, we did have some conversation about, you know, is there a way to do a drop off zone so we wouldn't need to worry about backing up vehicles at night. In reality, they're fairly long tow trucks, so it's, it's not really possible to drop them off without backing them in, um, but it should be fairly um, fairly quick. Um, the, their back lot is about 164 feet to the nearest house, which would be on Whisper Lane to the north. Um, I thought that Mr. Anderson could probably do a much better job explaining his business than I could, so I asked him to come this evening and speak to you. Um, just a couple other things. Uh, we did uh, work with our backup alarms. Uh, you know, uh, when you put them in reverse, they beep. I'm sure you're all familiar with that. Uh, we did some readings uh, right at the rear of the truck. Uh, <clears throat> backup alarm was 100 decibels, and uh, then we moved it 50 feet, and we brought that down to between 55 and 60 decibels. Uh, and that was covered, and it was uncovered, it was at 80 decibels. So, and, you know, we're not getting very fancy to try to cover the backup alarms. So with we just with your them. trucks, is, is, is this required by law, Dan, to... The backup alarms, oh yeah. They're DMT. required by law? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Even though you're in your own lot? Well, yeah, I mean, there's really no way of shutting them off, uh, other than... We t I talked to Natalie about this. She, su she suggested, you know, putting this on-off switch to turn them on and off. And, we, and I talked to my guys about this, and, and we all came to the same conclusion. You know, you could, that's fine and dandy. You can back up and shut it off, but then, you know, if he gets in a hurry or he forgets to turn it back on, you know, he's going to be out on the highway or he'll be in somebody else's parking lot and forget to turn it on. And then now we've got a truck that's backing up, no warning. 
I really, after thinking about it, I really wasn't too crazy about that idea. I, I'd rather just try and muffle the, uh, the alarm a little bit. Is it practical to muffle it? Yeah, it is. you know, and it, it wasn't, you know, it's no scientific, there's nothing, it's just, yeah. you know, stuff or, uh, some duct tape in there, and, and then quiet it down. And uh, and then I did Reduced one other test half, with Mr. the decimal meter at 150 feet, and you can't even hear it. All you hear is background noise that's going on the road, or, you know, we did it in our, our yard down in Shanahan, and the residual uh, noise from interstate was all you had really pricked up so it was at 150 feet it was nothing it was just real noise it's short no it's short lived it you know we you've got screw you got the fence you've got tree lines you got screening yeah. that's gonna muffle anyway yeah when you come in with the car you you back in you're you've got the truck in reverse maybe at the most uh, at the most I would say 60 seconds you park it in, you put it in park then you do your work you unload it five minutes you're out of there uh, you know, the, uh, the lot itself, it's got a 10 foot board on board fence on the back. Uh, the chain link is eight foot with the slots, which is nice for security. And it's got electric power gate. It's all remote control. So we'll have remotes in our truck. This is all stuff we already have at our facility. It's got security cameras. It's got a building alarm. Uh, like I said, the electric gate. And the uh, cameras is all what we need. It's it's about 80% of what we're looking for. The only downfall is we wish it had a shop. It's got a small shop, not enough, you know. And we just need something to do some minor repairs. We don't do any work on our own equipment. Uh, we take that out. The only thing we'll do is like uh, light bulbs, uh, that kind of stuff, you know, maybe. Headlights, turn signals. Yeah, it's nothing major. We take that out of the guy down in Elwood, so he it goes there. Uh, you know, Nailey touched on, I did a two-week snapshot of, uh, of the impounds. We did 40 in two weeks. Uh, 12 were between 6 p.m. and 6 a.m. So, you know, about one a, one a night if you average it out on a 14 days. But that's, that's about it. And like I said, they're in and out, they're quiet. We don't make a lot of noise. Uh, garbage truck picking up the trash on Tuesday makes more noise than what we're going to make. So. From a staff perspective, we weren't comfortable recommending anything that would turn off any safety equipment or anything like that. We talked about options, but we weren't comfortable recommending any of that. You know, one accident makes it completely not yeah. worth it. At 80 decibels at 50 feet, that's a little bit louder than a vacuum cleaner. I think a vacuum cleaner is 70 decibels, so that's probably like a circular saw or something yeah. like that. And this will be a public hearing and planning zoning next meeting? It'll be a public hearing and planning and zoning next meeting. Um, Mr. Anderson did not have a lot of time left at his property, so uh, he wanted some feedback to know whether it made sense to proceed, so we thought we'd bring it forward as a concept plan. Yeah, we're Fine. kind of under a timeline now. At the uh, end of October, we're meeting them. Anyone have any, anybody so have any questions? The properties to the north, how many would be notified, just two or three? Um, I got to think at least three, maybe four. Uh, probably, probably four on Whisper Lane, I would think. Okay. Is it a 250 foot notification? It's 150 foot less the rights of way. Okay. What type of lighting do you have down there at night? Uh, there is two lights on the building that face the west and then there's one on the north side of the building. Uh, we're not gonna put any lights up or anything. That's I'm, that's sufficient for us. Our, the trucks are all equipped with lights, so we actually don't need them. Are they currently being used? Do we know? I, you know, I never went down there at night to see, so I, I, I would assume so, yeah, but. There's, there's fewer trucks there than there were, but I would assume six months ago when Hammer Express was fully operating there that they were using um, the lights because they had trucks, a lot of trucks packed, parked behind the building. Okay. Yeah, he's got three sitting there now. Any other concerns? Well, we'd like you to come home, Dan, so, <laughs> you know. <laughs> the last question I have is, is overnight, there's probably no need to use air compressor and things like that to do uh, any fixing. We don't even have, well, the only, we will have an air compressor now. This is only gonna be our temporary home. Yeah. Me not even hook it up. Uh, no, we don't need them for anything other than blowing up a tire, so. So the loudest thing is gonna be a vacuum cleaner at 50 feet. Yeah, 
Is that what it is? Yeah. Once, on it's, average, once a night? Yeah, if that. You know, it's it's hard to say. You know, one night, yeah. you can be in and out two or three times, and, and then you might not turn a wheel for the next three. So. All right. Uh, no more questions. Yeah. Any other concerns? <clears throat> Glenn? Just, just one question. Well, maybe, maybe two. Yeah. Uh, just in case we have to get a hold of you, do yeah. we call Barack and Michelle there in Hawaii to go next door to knock on the door or what? No. Just, <laughs> you you all have my phone number. <laughs> okay. No, no, no. Just check it. Well, yeah. it sounds like an inside joke. But, yeah. <laughs> all right, well, then at that point, there's no objections to it. So go ahead and uh, so we'll send it forward. Then, uh, Perfect. Okay. All right, thanks, guys. Nice. All right, and then moving on to business item number six, be consideration for approval of a resolution approving $5.2 million to be applied towards our share of the construction, preliminary engineering, and design of the construction engineering expenses for the upcoming US 52 and Route 59 River Road to Hobolt Improvement Project, Public Works Director Noriega. Thank you, Mayor. So IDOT's currently working on their um, preliminary engineering phase one for the US 52 corridor project which goes from River Road over to Hobo. Uh, project includes widening of 52 to four lanes, center median, uh, mixed use path, and uh, the intersection widening at 52 and 59. Although the project, this is all IDOT, we will have some responsibilities on this. Um, so some of our responsibilities would be utility relocate, such as our water main and sanitary sewer, uh, there will be some traffic signal upgrades that we will uh, be responsible for. And then, of course, the street lighting. We've spoken about that uh, in the past. The street lighting is a significant cost. It's uh, approximately seven to $8 million. Because of that, and we are asking them to try to include this as part of the project, so we're you know, reducing the amount of construction inconveniences to our businesses. Uh, I got requested, though, that we pursue ITEP funding. It's a Illinois Transportation Enhancement Program uh, grant funding. Street lighting by itself is normally not eligible, but if we carefully craft the, the wording of our grant or our application, it is a, still as part of the entire IDOT project, so that makes it eligible. So if awarded, ITEP will cover approximately 50% of the construction costs, up to a maximum of $3 million if we're awarded. And as part of the application, we have to provide this uh, and approve this uh, resolution where staff is recommending approval of the resolution in the amount of $5.2 million to authorize appropriation of the village fund for the upcoming 5259 improvement project. Any questions? Can you explain where they are in the engineering and all that right now? Phase just to kind of phase one, just a little delayed. more of the overview and the timeline though? Yeah, so the, uh, the phase one is delayed approximately a year. Um, we anticipate that they will be finished with their phase one engineering uh, by mid to late next year. Then because of the size of this project and the amount of land acquisition, we anticipate phase two is gonna be close to, if not over two years. So by the time we go into possibly finishing all of the engineering and going to construction, we're looking at maybe 2028, 2029 timeframe. So this project's still a little ways down the road, but it's <clears throat> time to apply for grants and do what we can do. So we need this to be able to apply to that for that grant, the ITEP grant. Correct. Okay. It's part of the application. I have a question on the, the street lighting. And you probably brought this up a while back, but do we get a credit or for um, the aluminum poles that they would have normally have put in versus us going the upgrade to the black ones? I don't believe so. We don't. So they would do normally they would do a a a lighting study for what is actually needed and required of their project. Much of it is only at the intersection. For us, this is the added benefit for us is aesthetically because it's the decorative street lights. Where I don't believe that IDOT will provide any kind of credit to us. Hmm. Okay. I think you were asking us to clarify that. You're 
because IDOT won't put street lights all the way up and down the road. Now, but by the plaza going east, are those IDOTs currently? The, the those aluminum, aluminum the poles? Ones, yeah. uh, those are, I believe, ours. Sure, but. Okay. We just never did the black ones that far. Right. But I mean, IDOT's required to put some type of lighting in that section, right? Most likely only at the intersections. Really? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Hmm. Any other questions on that? If there's no other questions, I'll make a motion to approve as read. Motion by Trustee Amos. I'll second. Second by Trustee Carroll. Roll call, please. Amos. Yes. Brockman. Yes. Carol. Yes. Chapman. Yes. And Luciano. Yes. Right. Business item number six been approved. Business item number seven will be consideration for approval of a resolution accepting a grant of municipal utility easement and public utility and drainage easement to the village of Shorewood for pin number 0506151100005. Back to Public Works Director Norton. Thank you, Mayor. So we own this vacant parcel over at Helena Laura. Whether or not we decide to sell or uh, keep the property, that's good housekeeping to make sure that our utilities are in an easement. So just for housekeeping, um, that we do have a water main and a sanitary sewer that is along that east property line of that property. We would like to add it, we own it, we control it, we'd be uh, granting ourselves basically the easement. So in the future, if anything were to happen, it's already located in an easement. Staff is recommending approval of the resolution accepting the plan of easement grant for the municipal <laughs> utility easement and public utility and drainage easement to the village for to the village for the vacant parcel identified as 0506151110105. Any questions? We're granting ourselves a utilities are not our piece of land we own, so that way we don't lose it. Anybody have any questions? I'll make that motion. Trust, uh, motion by Trustee Luciano. Second. Second to Trustee Carroll. Roll call, please. Brockman. Yes. Carroll. Yes. Chapman. Yes. Luciano. Yes. And Amos. Yes. All right, we'll move into department reports, uh, community development. Thank you. Um, you may have noticed that the YMCA has put up their silt fence and they're getting prepared to um, do the grading on the property. Um, so that project is underway. We are planning to have a public hearing to discuss their full site plan in October. Um, we'll also have the public hearing to discuss the Anderson's towing proposal in October. Um, and as staff, we're working on those YMCA site plans I mentioned, and we're working on some site plans for legacy fire apparatus at Earl and Geneva. Very good. A few more things coming up in October there. Uh, finance is not here. We'll move right into parks. Good evening. Just a couple of quick reminders. This weekend is our fall community-wide garage sale. The list of participating homes is on our website. That can be found under the residence tab and then garage sales. There is a printable PDF list and then a Google interactive map. You can see all the homes for that. Our annual touch a truck is also this weekend at Seamies Four Seasons Park on Saturday from 10 to 2. So be sure to stop by that as well as Troy Fire uh, District's open house at Station 2 is going out at the same time. So you get a bit of a two-for-one there for the family. And then next Saturday, the 21st, is our October Fest at Seanies Four Seasons Park from 3.30 to 11.30. We'll have German music, German food, beer, craft beer, a lot of fun for the family. So be sure to stop by. Thank you. Thank you very much. With that, uh, over to police. Chief. Thank you, Mayor. No report, but a reminder that our national afternoon out will be the same day as Oktoberfest from noon until 3 at Scenes Four Seasons Park. Thank you very much. Public Works. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Just a couple construction updates here. So River Edge Park, Phase A, we are, uh, the contractors moving at a very good pace. Uh, the construction of the sidewalks, the curb, uh, a lot of the parking lot has uh, begun, shelters already installed. Comp Pan is the playground equipment that we had selected for this park. Uh, their expected delivery for the playground is next week. So you'll start seeing the playground getting installed. 
Uh, Earl and Geneva construction, the water main installation is progressing very quickly here. So the, the water main is almost complete. We anticipate that in the next week and a half to two weeks, we will be flushing, chlorinating, pressure testing, and water sampling the, the new main. And once that all of that stuff passes, we'll be again transferring the businesses along that uh, the roadway to the new main. Facility staff continues to coordinate all of the construction for the repairs over at the police department. Most of the EFIS wall repairs are completed. Uh, the door replacement uh, on the west side of the building is ongoing. Uh, the roof contractor began today and the painting is moving forward once now that we have the color selection for the building. Um, just a reminder for um, coming up next month, um, Public Works begins our leaf collection program. So we begin the second full week of October, so that's October 14th that week. Uh, we'll be collecting on curbside um, through December 1st or until the first uh, accumulation of snow. And then just a reminder, waste management will continue to pick up uh, landscaping through the 15th. Any questions? Thank you, sir. Administrator. No Trustee comments, Trustee Amos. No comments tonight, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Trustee Brockman. Thank you, our next meeting will be October 2nd and uh, Natalie had a few of the agenda items, so maybe there'll be a few more by then. It's too early, too early to know right now. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Trustee Carroll. No comment. Trustee Chap. Yeah, no comment. Uh, Trustee Lucian. Citizens Advisory Committee will be meeting September 26th. And as always, if anyone's interested in becoming involved with it, they can contact myself or any of the other members. And the information for contact is on the bill's website. So. Thank you. Uh, with that, I need, I'm going to have request a motion to go into executive session to discuss land sale lease of village owned property. There'll be no action taken. We will adjourn from executive. Though. So moved. Motion, Trustee Amos. Second. Second, Trustee Luciano. Roll call, please. Carol. Yes. Chapman. Yes. Luciano. Yes. Amos. Yes. And Brockton. Yes. All right. We'll jump to the back real quick.